Good day, everyone. My name is Jessica Poros, and I'm the Senior Manager for Education and Outreach at CAQH Core. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to our third webinar in the series on electronic healthcare attachments. Today's webinar will focus on clinical document metadata. Before we begin, I would like to mention a few logistical items. You'll be able to download a copy of today's presentation from the CAQH.org website in the next 24 hours. To do so, navigate to the core pull-down menu at the top of the CAQH.org welcome screen and select the core education events page. A link to the PDF version of the presentation, as well as the recording, will be found under the listing for today's webinar. We will save time at the end of today's program to respond to audience questions. You are encouraged to submit your questions at any time during the webinar by typing them into the questions panel on your dashboard. We do ask that when you submit questions uh, to please identify the type of organization you're with so we can give you a more applicable response. Our session today will start with an overview of CAQH Core's work on attach attachments before we move on to a detailed presentation on clinical document metadata for attachments, focusing on the CDA header. I want to remind you that this is a 90-minute presentation. We would like to thank our guest speaker for joining us today. Rick Geimer is the Chief Innovation Officer for Lantana Consulting Group, and we are very happy to have him here with us today. So now let's get started with today's program. And this first presentation is an overview of CAQH core attachment work from our director, Bob Bowman. Bob? Great, thank you, Jessica. Um, as Jessica mentioned, um, we do have, this is the third in a series of uh, presentations and webinars that we've done um, partnership with Lantana, and we hope to continue that partnership through next year as well uh, with additional education opportunities. So on the next slide, you'll see that particular for the purpose of this webinar, um, we are focusing on how the technical components of electronic attachments can save time and improve efficiencies. So the objectives specifically are to learn how electronic attachments can reduce administrative burden by looking at a specific example, the CDA, the Clinical Document Architecture, along with other um, you know, potential attachment standards like the X12275 or the HL7 FIRE transaction. These types of, of standards um, are going to be important as we move forward in the discussion of how attachments can um, reduce uh, administrative burden both for providers as well as health plans and how vendors and clearinghouses can help uh, support the adoption of the transaction. So understanding um, some of the important components of specific transactions like the header of the CDA and the types of data within there um, is really going to be helpful. So we are taking this deep dive into the technical architecture of the transactions of specific standards um, here in this third of our webinar series. If we move to the next slide, you'll see that with um, CAQH Core, our specific mission and vision uh, with our mission of creating and adopting healthcare operating rules that support both standards as well as interoperability between clinical administrative activities for all stakeholder types. Um, with our vision as being a facilitator, we try to bring everyone together. Um, we're Switzerland and everyone has a say and everyone has a vote on exactly where the industry needs to move and evolve. And we do that through a very unique approach in the industry and that's through our seven step integrated model. Everything from the deep dive and research environmental scan that this actually is part of, that this webinar series is part of, through the developing of, development of the operating rules, designing exactly what that looks like through certification, building awareness and education, technical assistance, adoption, tracking ROI, and maintaining and updating that particular rule set. All that's very important for us um, as an organization as well as for the industry. And that is partly why we were named by the HHS secretary to write operating rules for, um, from Section 1104, but that is really gonna be key because as we move forward, um, we're going to be writing operating rules for the attachments as well. So moving on to the next slide, exactly what are um, operating rules? What are the role of operating rules? Operating rules really help uh, facilitate the administrative interoperability between clinical administrative data. And we have to make sure that we have the role and perspective of each, of each stakeholder as, as part of that discussion. 
we do ensure that the operating rules look at both healthcare and industry neutral standards. Any standard that might help the industry move forward, we're gonna look at those and see if we can't bring those into the fold and make sure that they help the industry move forward. We do look at other industries as well. Um, the types of operating rules we develop fall into two different categories, the infrastructure as well as data content rules. The infrastructure rules really just allow for the definement of the roles and responsibilities of the trading partners, how data gets from point A to point B, what you should expect in receiving that. Um, the data content rules are specific to what data is within that standard or within the metadata even of the, the transactions that moves through EDI or through the web or through uh, whatever type of, of mechanism it is moving through. Um, what type of data is important to ensure that the receiver has the right data, the sender's sending the right data, and that data is important for that business transaction that's taking place. Um, moving on to the next slide, you'll see that um, we do look at a variety of both types of standards. There's HIPAA and healthcare specific standards, as well as other types of standards by the recognized by other industries that are gonna be important for this discussion not just with attachments, but with any type of operating rule that we do uh, write and develop, but specifically for attachments, there's a number that are going to be at play. We also look at a specific criteria when we look at and develop operating rules. We have to make sure that the operating rules don't repeat or contradict any standard. We have to make sure that the operating rules are aligning both the administrative and the clinical worlds together. Um, we don't want to have to have providers or entities uh, like software vendors and clearinghouses develop different um, options and support different types of things because they're on two different sides of the house. Um, we have to address uh, most common business scenarios. We don't want to do one-offs. We do try to fill gaps uh, created by the flexibility within standards. And that's a great thing about many of the standards. They're very flexible. They can bend and shape to what the needs are. But sometimes that flexibility is too broad and it, it actually doesn't foster ad adoption. Um, attachments have, have been talked about since 1996 when a really, really um, broad way and we still don't have a um, broad industry consensus on exactly what the standard should be and where we're going at t tomorrow. Hopefully we do, but, but some of that uh, flexibility has allowed for not a lot of, of momentum for a particular uh, one standard to be the, 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 the base for attachment standards. Um, moving on to the next slide, you'll see that we also have to consider um, very key components of uh, operating rules when we develop those types of operating rules for, a t for electronic attachments. Um, again, remember, it should be easy in the workflow. It should be something that's easy. It should be something that is um, not um, prohibitively expensive for providers and health plans to adopt. Um, so with our mission and, and with our mission and vision as it is, a critical goal for us is to solving this challenge. How can we ensure that uh, a set of standards for attachments can be adopted? Uh, we know that Section 1104 of the ACA does require um, standards to be adopted by HHS. As, as of yet, those have, that has not happened. Um, so working forward, um, as the industry has, and, and working um, particular work done by HL7, which is a standard development organization, uh, they're working on standards for claims attachments. So we're looking at those types of standards that are in play, that are part of the discussion, that are, uh, and some of these are, are very focused on a particular type or function that attachments have, but we need to make sure that uh, we're aware of what's going on in the industry. So again, part of the education series is to, to focus in on that. Um, if we can look at the next slide, you'll see that um, very specifically for um, uh, meaningful use requirements for uh, providers, um, is important because they've looked at and focused specifically on the HL7 standards for clinical attachment. Um, currently, there's no authoritative benchmark for exactly how broad that adoption is, how many transactions are being conducted, what this really means for providers and the health plans and what types of savings are being um, made by the industry. We do know that being for you stage two, objectives were to have measurable benchmarks um, for for you know, professionals and hospitals, they need to exactly adopt these with their EHR technology. You know, providers must show, must show that they are using EHR technologies to a certain measure and they have to be measurable. Um, electronic attachments can improve the process of providing a way for supporting documentation to, to be submitted with the medical claim. 
the meaningful use requirements um, can be laid on top of the CDA document templates, um, such as the CDA header. So this may be very important. Again, combining both the administrative and the clinical data components um, for admin SIMP is, is going to be really key. So we're looking at uh, what this means for the industry as we move forward. Um, so what are we looking at when it comes to the background of attachments and where we have been and where we are today. On the next slide, you can see some of the federal activities that have taken place to date on attachments. So the last few years, SVHS has sent letters to HHS secretary supporting an incremental flexible use of operating rules to move attachments from paper to an electronic document. So there has been progress at the federal level in ensuring that the industry is aware of different types of standards that can be used, it should be broadly supported, and that it should be um, something that can be uh, uh, really uh, helping move the industry forward to an electronic documentation process. Um, there were key dates um, in 2016 as well. NSHS held a hearing on electronic healthcare attachment standards, and they also sent a letter in July of last year uh, to the HE Secretary summarizing those findings with a recommendation on a specific set of uh, implemental attachment standards. HHS has yet to uh, publish um, uh, a regulation regarding that particular letter or recommendation to date. On the next slide, you can see how the work that we've done here at CAQH Core over the last few years related to attachments as well. Um, starting back in 2012, we conducted research identifying how regulatory process can help. We did support and wrote a letter of recommendation uh, for NCHS as well. We supported the information that they that they also supported and recommended to HHS. Um, in 2014, we held over uh, we held a series of listening sessions with over 300 participants to discuss the trends, discuss uh, really what they're doing with attachments as of today. What does that mean? What kind of formats are they using? some of the technical requirements, how they're conducting the transactions, how they're receiving the transactions, how they're converting paper uh, into electronic uh, attachments. Uh, that was kind of the scope for our 2014 and 2015 work. And also, um, CORE sent a letter to NCVHS supporting the recommendations for the set of implementable attachment standards. Again, um, CORE was designated by HHS to write operating rules for all the HIPAA transactions. So we're starting that work and we're very invested in the process for um, attachments as well. Uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, you can see that we do have a timeline with very specific milestones related to the work that we're going to be doing for attachments. So the stage one here that we're in today is conducting a series of industry education series and thought leadership. Um, also, we're going to be and have initially just launched our environmental scan. More about that in just a moment. The findings from our environmental scan will help us move into stage three, which is the an attachments of advisory group that we will be co-chairing um, with core participants to ensure that a subset of the participants are looking at the findings from our environmental scan. And then we can help launch a subgroup later in 2018 to tackle um, potential operating rules for attachments. So this it's a multi-stage approach. We hope to engage all the stakeholder types that are important, both providers, health plus vendors, and clearinghouses, to ensure that everyone, again, is part of that discussion. Um, if we move on to the next slide, this gives you just a little bit more detail about the scope of work that we have. Um, again, with our education series, this is our third one for the year. Uh, um, going one more in depth and in detail on particular types of attachment standards. Again, we laid the groundwork earlier, um, and those uh, those types of, uh, I'm sorry, those webinars are also available for free on our website if you want to catch up to where we're at today. But also, our environmental scan will be conducting um, uh, different trends uh, within the industry on where attachments are. We'll be conducting provider site visits to watch how providers um, convert paper to electronic, how they submit their electronic attachments what types of electronic attachments they're sending. Uh, we will also be doing a series of interviews with various stakeholders, with core participants, um, both health plans and software vendors and clearinghouses and providers um, to ensure that we understand exactly how um, the attachment process is working today. Where are the inefficiencies? Where are the gaps? Where can potential operating rules um, have the greatest impact? With that, we'll, we'll be, we will be co-chairing an advisory group 
um, again, from core participants, a small subset of folks that will help us and guide us as we potentially have you know, 20 or 30 potential opportunity areas, help that, that group will help us whittle that down to the eight or 10 or so opportunity areas that can be very focused, that have the most impact, and can also help drive the industry forward with adoption of uh, electronic attachment standards. The subgroup will actually look at those eight or 10 different areas and then focus um, the rule development uh, and the requirements gathering specifically for whatever rules are developed from from that group. So the subgroup does the heavy lift with the rule requirement. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that the just some details of our environmental scan and what we hope to do and achieve over the next few months. Again, we are to, the goal is to help inform the development of the draft opportunity areas. Again, that list can be quite extensive because we're going to look at the key components of what um, the various types of attachments requirements are both for claims, prior authorizations, audits, referrals, not just on claims because we know and understand that the attachments process is very important for very other, various other functions when it comes to administrative uh, transactions and conduct on business processes between providers and health plans. Um, we're going to look at volumes of attachments. We're going to see what types of attachments, what type of a documentation is key, what types of data within those attachments are key for provider and health plan interaction. We're going to be looking at how PMS systems use and produce attachments, how they can send them. Um, do providers have to um, have different logins and, and passwords and, and use portals? What's that process? What's it really look like? That's what the in intent of the scan goal is. Again, we'll be conducting interviews and site visits over the next six months or so uh, to ensure, again, that we have a detailed analysis of that workflow. Um, we do want to make sure that for anyone on the webinar today, as well, whether you're a core participant or not, if you are interested in, a, in being part of that interview process or being part of an on-site visit where we can come out and visit and watch and see how you do things, if you're interested in that work, please let us know at core at caqh.org. With that, I'll hand the call over to Jessica for our first polling question. Jessica? Thank you, Bob. Um, so we are going to take a, a quick pause here and take two polling uh, questions. The first polling question, um, as you just heard Bob uh, describe our environmental scan efforts, um, we are looking, you know, this effort is only as successful as the people that contribute to it. So. Um, for the first polling question, let's go ahead and launch it. Uh, if you're interested in participating in the CAQH core environmental scan on attachments, um, please respond. The options are yes, no, need more information. Um, so let's take a few seconds. Um, I think maybe we'll give it five more seconds. And we can share those results. Um, thank you very much. I see that there's a lot of um, interest. Um, so for those of you who said yes, thank you very much. And those who said need more information, we will follow up with you shortly. Um, and now uh, let's take the next polling question. Um, so I'm not going to uh, read the whole question, but uh, the main gist is of the infrastructure requirements currently established in the phase, this is one through four, the AQH core operating rules, which, which requirement is most applicable in addressing attachments? Um, and the responses are connectivity and security, response time, system availability, acknowledgments, and companion guide. We know that a lot of these requirements are important, but what we want to hear is which is the most important. So let's go ahead and launch that poll. So which requirements will be most helpful uh, in your industry and in your day-to-day -day activities? So let's give it five more seconds and then we will show the res share the results. Great. So let's share those results. And there are two clear areas of, that have more in, interest, uh, connectivity and security, as well as companion guide. Um, Bob, um, any uh, quick reactions to this uh, 
the polling question? What do you think yeah, of this response? Yeah, I think this is great. I think that um, there's probably a lot of uncertainty between um, trading partners on how and what they're conducting and how they do this and how we move forward as an industry. So companion guides are going to be key to having um, trading partners understand the process as well as the connectivity and security kind of falls in the same in, in that same bucket, I think, because um, how you submit the data and what you're going to use as, as a health plan and a provider as they're trying to interact and conduct the transactions can be very important. So definitely um, some key takeaways for us. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Bob. And you know, the other three responses um, also had a pretty strong showing. So um, I think um, we have our work cut out for us, right? Um, so thank you very much. Um, let's uh, go on with our next presentation. Um, so we will continue our program with Rick Geimer from Lantana Consulting Group, uh, and he'll focus on the CDA header. Rick, welcome. Thank you, Jessica and, uh, and Bob. Uh, welcome all. As uh, Jessica announced, I'm Rick Geimer, uh, Chief Innovation Officer from Lantana Consulting Group, and we'll be walking through clinical document metadata for attachments today. Uh, next slide. So the rough outline of the session is we're going to give a brief introduction around attachment standards in general. Um, th these have been uh, uh, discussed in detail on some previous webinars, which we have uh, links to later on in this presentation. So we won't spend a lot of time on the sort of high-level overview of standards, uh, but we will just give a quick refresher. Um, from there, we'll dive into uh, the, the main topic of this uh, session, which is uh, HL7's clinical document architecture. Um, we'll give an overview of the standard itself, and then a lot of technical details on the CDA header, which is the, the metadata uh, uh, that is common among all CDA-based specifications. And then we'll go into a wrap-up that will include some, some questions and such. Uh, next slide. Um, and uh, apologies here, my screen is uh, lagging a little bit behind. Um, okay, so uh, um, basically the audience for this uh, uh, session uh, is largely technical in nature. So we expect that uh, implementers at payer, provider, or clearinghouse settings uh, who are actually interested in uh, in making these uh, standards work, uh, you know, building interfaces, exchanging uh, attachments as clinical documents and such. So largely software architects, developers, information analysts, IT staff, uh, information managers, and so on. Uh, but really anyone needing technical details on the use of CDA and attachments. Again, those wanting more of a high-level sort of executive view, uh, I would refer to you to the uh, previous webinars on the topic. Okay, next slide. So uh, um, on this slide, uh, we just kind of list the uh, relevant X12 standards for attachments. Um, we won't be going into much detail on these. I just bring them up there just for, for awareness. Um, the primary ones that we uh, typically deal with and, and we'll call out specifically in this uh, um, session are the X12-277 uh, uh, RFI for requesting attachments and also the 275 uh, for submitting uh, an attachment after a request. Next slide. So the standards we'll be going into um, more detail on are the HL7 ones in this case, which really represent the payload uh, 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 of an attachment. Uh, the base standard we'll be talking about is HL7's Clinical Document Architecture, or CDA standard. Uh, this is an international standard. It's been around since 2005, and it is very generic. It can be used throughout the world to define any type of clinical document. Um, but uh, what we typically find is in order for it to be useful for, for a particular use case or for use in a particular country, it needs to be customized. Um, and uh, this is done through what are called implementation guides. And uh, um, oh, there are several listed below on this slide. Uh, the most uh, uh, common one, the mo one that folks have most probably heard of, is called Consolidated CDA. Uh, this is a list of what I would call the most common document types that are used for primary care or for transfer of care. Uh, and this particular guide was cited under meaningful use. And so um, uh, most EHRs uh, that are certified under meaningful use uh, need to be able to export consolidated CDA documents. So just uh, uh, again, to, to sort of explain there, a uh, consolidated CDA is a kind of CDA. CDA is the generic base standard. Consolidated CDA says how we use the clinical document architecture specification in the U.S. for primary care and transfer of care. Um, 
That said, there are many other implementation guides out there that are relevant for attachments. Uh, um, uh, I show an example of the periodontal attachment implementation guide there, and, and there are quite a few others. Um, the most important of those others I listed at the very bottom, which is the HL7 Attachments Implementation Guide. Um, so there is actually a publication that says how to use um, a consolidated CDA and other implementation guides as attachments um, uh, in the U.S. Um, this includes both structured data and unstructured data, which I'll uh, uh, describe a little bit when I talk about the uh, uh, CDA body. Um, and uh, uh, basically, it's a, it's a good read. It gives you a lot of high-level guidance, um, much of which we'll cover in this presentation. But if you want to go to a guide for more details, specifically um, uh, around attachments, that's probably your go-to uh, uh, guide at this point. Next slide. So this is just a sort of very high-level, big-picture overview of uh, the, the current standards framework and uh, what what we see emerging in the future. Um, you know, currently when people are submitting attachments, often they're uh, going to a, um, uh, a provider or a, sorry, a payer or clearinghouse's web portal and maybe uh, scanning and uploading a PDF uh, document. Uh, some who are a bit more advanced are perhaps uh, sending PDFs in uh, an X12275 transaction. Um, but the way that the um, uh, you know it's an attachments guide is uh, is designed, and the um, uh, it looks like the, the the likely regulation coming out of CMS uh, uh, is pointing to the use of HL7 CDA, which can include both unstructured bodies like a PDF, uh, as well as structured documents such as those that are coming out of EHR. So it really gives you one overarching framework with a common set of metadata to deal with uh, um, all those uh, options. Uh, uh, using basically the same framework. And that would be transferred using X12 uh, uh, 275 transaction again. Uh, looking forward to the future, uh, uh, HL7 has been developing a standard that's known as FIRE, which can be used uh, both to represent content, but also has a corresponding API component, uh, what we call a RESTful API, in other words, one built on uh, HTTP and RESTful web services. Um, and uh, uh, we spent some time in HL7 prototyping uh, the FIRE APIs to see if they could be used uh, for the same purposes as the X12, 275, and 277 RFI transactions. Um, and uh, so far, that's been successful. There are still a lot of details to be worked out, um, including developing an implementation guide for how this might be used in the future. Um, uh, but, but sort of list that as an emerging standard. And one thing to note about it, since FIRE is an API and a way of representing content, it is possible to send you know, existing HL7 CDA documents using FIRE APIs, as well as um, you know, a feature specification called CCDA on FIRE uh, um, as well. So as we move towards representing content in FIRE versus just the APIs, uh, it works equally well for that. Next slide. So uh, to explain a little bit about how X12 and CDA work together, it it, um, it helps to you know, think metaphorically and, and consider X12, the 275 transaction, basically to be an envelope. Um, it ties the attachment inside uh, to the patient and the claim. You can consider that like some of the address information on the on the top of the envelope, um, and uh, um, you know could also marry it to the attachment request in a solicited scenario. Inside that envelope is the CDA document. Uh, this contains detailed patient demographics, author and attester information, who's signing the document, what kind of document it is, as well as all the detailed clinical information that could either be uh, structured data uh, uh, and you know th that's fully coded, or unstructured data such as a PDF. But the idea is all that demographic, author and tester information, and such, all that metadata is the same regardless of whether the body is structured or, or not. So again, CDA basically is just the payload in a 275 envelope. Uh, it is uh, Base64 encoded and then included in the um, binary data segment. Uh, next slide. So here's a, a basic orchestration for an unsolicited attachment scenario. In this case, the provider um, is submitting a claim. And at the same time, they know that this particular kind of claim for this particular service, that the payer always needs um, some supporting documentation. So in addition to sending the X12-837 claim, uh, they're also simultaneously going to send an X12-275 uh, transaction with a CDA-based attachment inside. 
Uh, this way, uh, when the claim submitted, the payer has everything they need to fully adjudicate the, the claim and uh, um, uh, process it appropriately. Next slide. Another scenario is the uh, solicited um, uh, scenario. In this case, the provider sends uh, the claim along to the payer, uh, but may not uh, know exactly what kind of information the payer uh, needs needs to request, if any. In this case, the payer will review that claim and decide well that they do need some further information, some more documentation. So they're going to send an X12-277 RFI back to the provider uh, asking for that information. That will include, for instance, a, a, a link code or a document type code saying what kind of documentation they uh, are requesting. The provider then would respond by uh, uh, looking at the documentation that was requested and either sending that uh, exact documentation or if they decide they have something more specific or an alternate because uh, maybe the exact thing requested was not available, uh, they could send that back in the 275, again, as a CDA-based attachment. And, and in both uh, the previous slide and this one, we note that there are um, uh, circles in the center there for a clearinghouse. That's basically showing that a clearinghouse could be an intermediary here um, between the uh, payer and the provider and uh, you know, potentially do things like assist the provider with actually creating the X12 transaction. Maybe the provider would upload their documents through a portal and the clearinghouse would handle the X12 part of it. So uh, we just like to illustrate that there. Uh, next slide. So this one here gives a, a little bit more detail on what the uh, what act, what it actually looks like behind the scenes. So we've got a sample X12 275 transaction up here on the scene, uh, on the screen. If you notice down at the BDS segment, uh, we've got this little dot dot dot, and it says Base64 encoded CDA goes here. Uh, if you were to expand that and just just go ahead and advance the animation there, Jessica. Um, the Base64 uh, content um, would, would basically be um, you know again uh, uh, some uh, let's take a second to go up there. Yeah, uh, the basically would look like this. Uh, on its own, it's unreadable. So you would actually need to extract that segment and then uh, unencode it. And uh, if you advance the animation one more time, uh, what you end up uh, at that point is an unencoded uh, CDA XML document. So this uh, represents uh, a subset of the metadata that we'll be talking about. But this is basically what CDA XML looks like um, in its in its raw form. Right, uh, so let's go ahead and move on to the CDA overview. So next slide. And uh, one more, if you don't mind. All right, um, so uh, uh, some of this is a little bit redundant for what I said before, but repetition uh, <laughs> always exists with understanding. So uh, CDA, or Clinical Document Architecture, is a specification for exchange of clinical documents. It's both an ANSI standard and an ISO standard, so it's international in scope, and it is used throughout the world um, uh, for exchanging clinical documents. Uh, clinical documents, just to differentiate them from messages, are basically the defined, authenticated part of the clinical record. Um, uh, clinical documents are human readable, and every CDA document, in addition to you know being XML and having all that coded data and, and such, you can always bring it up and render it in a web browser using a, uh, a, a, a provided style sheet. Um, uh, in addition to that, it can contain machine readable or, or coder data uh, as such. Um, in the base CDA spec, it's optional, but many CDA implementation guides like consolidated CDA require the use of coded data. So you'll, you'll find that uh, coded data to be quite common in the US. And it's important to note that CDA is an architecture uh, um, for creating clinical documents, again, in, in any country uh, if for any use case. So in order to be useful for a particular use case, it needs to be constrained. Um, and that's where we do things like create implementation guides like Consolidated CDA, um, uh, which is cited under for meaningful use and, again, describes the document types for primary and transfer of care in the U.S. Next slide. So uh, there are several key characteristics that differentiate uh, uh, clinical documents from messages. Uh, first of all, they're persistent. They're actually, um, uh, they have uh, being legally signed documents. They have legal retention periods, typically things like seven years. So uh, when you deal with CDA documents, you might want to think about, at least if you're creating them, things like document management, records management, and such. Um, stewardship, that just basically means that there's an organization that needs to maintain or persist the documents. Potential. Potential for authentication, clinical documents are meant to be signed by clinicians. 
um, context. Uh, CDA documents basically uh, provide metadata, uh, which we'll be talking about today, that gives context. It tells you who the patient is, who the provider is, uh, what encounter dates were present, what kind of document it is, when it was created. All that provides context for the clinical content that follows. Uh, wholeness, uh, clinical documents tell a whole story, typically the things like a, a history and physical or a discharge summary um, that, that give all the information that you need about that particular encounter. Um, they're typically not data fragments like just a patient's blood pressure. Um, so you, when you get a clinical document, you will basically get everything uh, relevant to an encounter or, or a period of stay and such. Um, and lastly, probably the most important for this group is the human readability. Again, any of these CDA documents, you can always bring up in a web browser and view them. So even if you're not ready to process all the coded information that's present, uh, it is very simple just to render these documents and uh, uh, continue operating as you do today. If you're, uh, for instance, a payer or a clearinghouse organization and you're receiving um, uh, PDF documents or uh, you know other scanned documents and such, fax documents perhaps, um, you you can still continue with that sort of human readable workflow and add uh, support for coded processing later as it's beneficial to you. Okay, next slide. So CDA documents consist of two major parts. First of all is the header, uh, um, which is the main focus of this webinar. The header identifies who the patient, the author, the custodian, or the organization that's persisting this document the kind of document, and a variety of other fields. Um, the idea is the CDA header is sufficient for medical records management, document management, uh, and, and such. It makes it very easy to um, look up and find the documents very quickly. It's, uh, in other words, it's the kind of information that you would want to query on, such as, you know, I want to find uh, patient John Doe's latest history and physical. Um, and uh, that, all that information is present and indexable using the CDA header information, and you can quickly retrieve the kind of documents that you're looking for. CDA body is what contains the clinical content or the attested content uh, in, in the document. Again, CDA can support both a structured body and a non-XML non body. Um, we're actually working on an enhancement to CDA or, or to consolidate CDA in the implementation guide that makes use of a very simple XML body um, so that you don't necessarily have to compromise by creating a PDF if, if all you want to do is share some human readable content and can use native CDA XML markup uh, the whole way through. So that's a, a future standard. I just, we just mentioned it briefly here to let you know that it's coming. And again, this webinar will focus on the CDA header. Next slide. So, um, uh, Consolidated CDA, or CCDA as it's known, is a U.S. wrong implementation guide that was cited under meaningful use, and much of the information that is required under meaningful use is covered by the CDA header. Uh, you know, all the patient demographics, like the patient name, sex, birth date, race, ethnicity, language, and such, are present, as well as detailed information on the care team members. Um, there are other meaningful use, uh, meaningful use required uh, data elements, such as um, coded vital signs, problems, meds, and allergies and such, and we'll discuss those in a future webinar where we discuss the CCDA structured body. Um, so this one, again, will focus on the um, document metadata and patient demographic information that's required under, under meaningful use. Next slide. So this is an example of what a CDA document looks like when it's rendered in a web browser. As you can see, it's it's quite readable. We've got a um, in this example, uh, we're using a style sheet that puts a table of contents on the left side and shows the main patient information uh, uh, on the right. Um, you can look through here and read uh, the patient's name, their key uh, demographics like date of birth, sex, uh, and, and such, present all their contact information, as well as information below about the. Um, uh, uh, the, the author and, and other participants in this document. Uh, um, go ahead and advance the animation. In the uh, XML that pops up here now, uh, this is what actually is recorded behind the scenes. So this information here, as you can see, is uh, um, uh, f fully structured. So you can pull out, uh, for instance, you know, the, um, the record target, which is CDA's name for the patient. 
uh, their um, information in the patient role, in other words, uh, you know, such as uh, you know, what their uh, their address is, their telephone information, their uh, patient's name, gender, all that, again, uh, is present in a fully structured and coded fashion, so you can pull that out and process it programmatically if you wish. But again, you're not required to do that. Uh, all you need to do is bring it up on a web browser and, and view it if you're not uh, prepared to parse this information yet. But just be aware that it is there and it can help facilitate uh, claims adjudication uh, and, and such in the future. Next slide. Okay, so uh, go to advance one more. Now we'll go into details on the CDA header. Um, beginning with the required metadata, and uh, uh, um, that, that's present. Uh, so uh, everything under the required uh, field there on the left, uh, we will cover uh, in, in individual slides. So we'll go over them in detail here. Uh, there are uh, some uh, several optional metadata fields that are also listed in the H07 attachments guides. Um, I'll just just briefly dis discuss them, um, but but not go into detail. We will have example slides. Again, I would refer you to the HL7 uh, attachments implementation guide and consolidated CDA if you want more details. But I'll also show you where to go to look uh, for, for look up examples of some of this kind of information. So uh, next slide. So as we walk through the CDA header, the key objectives are for um, uh, attendees to understand uh, the CDA header, understand its purpose and its uh, um, uh, overall structure, uh, learn how how to comply with the HL7 attachments implementation guides. Again, we're going to focus on the minimum requirements in this webinar um, versus all the optional stuff uh, so that you can immediately uh, go ahead and, and pick it up and, and start complying with those guides. And then we'll show you where to go for more information. Again, everyone has their own uh, special sauce, their little bit of extra data that they want to share, and um, we can't cover all that uh, uh, in, in this time, but we'll, again, show you where to go for more information so you can look that up yourselves. Next slide. Um, so on the following slides, we're going to, again, show the minimum data necessary to satisfy each required field. Uh, we will introduce HL7 version 3 data types and uh, terminology and some tooling uh, as they are encountered. Um, uh, so that you've got sort of real-time information to address some of your questions when you see funny things like object identifiers or OIDs up on screen. Uh, just be, be aware that in a slide or two, we'll actually discuss what they are. And I also like to point out that uh, variable data uh, is shown in blue. What I mean by variable data is data that you would populate or, or, uh, 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 with your own information. Um, so these slides, basically, you can, um, if you're a software developer, you can almost pick up the XML fragments in here and use them in your uh, applications directly. But you will need to be aware that anything that I've highlighted in blue uh, shouldn't be copied and pasted directly. That should be replaced with your own data, such as your own patient name uh, and, and such, or your patient's gender. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and move on. So the first field that I like to bring up is the template ID. Um, so this is a, a, a part of a CDA document that identifies what implementation guide or implementation guides it conforms to. Um, so I mentioned very early that CDA itself is a generic standard, it's international in scope. Uh, so it is important to customize it for a particular use case. And um, the way that we identify that a CDA document has been uh, 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 you know, or, or meets the needs of a particular implementation guide or use case is through a template ID. And this one here basically states that this document conforms to the consolidated CDA US realm header, which is the agreed upon set of metadata common among uh, all um, uh, consolidated CDA document types and frankly, all document types that are legal for attachments in the US. So in other words, every instance of a CDA document that you would send for an attachment will need to have this template ID present. Now, that said, there may be additional template IDs depending on the kind of document. So there is, in addition to the U.S. realm header, there's a second template ID if you're, uh, for instance, exchanging a discharge summary that you would add as well, which is why I put that in blue, is that you may need to populate that, uh, that field with additional template IDs um, uh, uh, as, you, as your documents and such mature. Next slide. So, so next up is the document ID. So every CDA document uh, needs a globally unique ID 
for it. Uh, this is important to ensure that when you're receiving documents from multiple provider organizations, for instance, uh, that you can differentiate them, that they don't have overlapping IDs that could potentially have you um, replace one patient's record with another. Um, so um, most commonly, uh, you know, there are several options for creating global unique IDs in CDA, but the most common one, the only one I'm going to recommend here, is the use of a UUID or GUID. Um, these are basically randomly generated uh, um, IDs that are guaranteed to be globally unique. Uh, so there's really no reason not to use one unless you've, um, if you're just implementing uh, out of CDA out of the blue and don't already have an existing document ID mechanism that you're using internally. Um, so next up. Uh, I think we'll move on to the document type code. So next slide. Yeah. So every CDA document requires a document type code to be present. Uh, this is the, um, these codes use the LOINC coding system uh, to represent uh, document type codes. And um, basically every document will have a code. Uh, um, there are many uh, that are present in LOINC, but they represent, you know, the example we'll show here is a diagnostic imaging report. There are codes for a history and physical, for a procedure note, for an operative note. So all those have their own uh, uh, codes associated with them. And by, by using these codes instead of relying on titles, it lets you um, process these documents generically and uh, deal with the fact that local practices might name things slightly different. Uh, but regardless of those minor differences in, in naming, they should all map to the same line code. So this way you can catalog uh, uh, all documents from all recipients quite efficiently. Next slide. So um, as you noticed on the previous slide, there was that sort of string of uh, uh, numbers and uh, periods, uh, uh, or digits and dots, if, if, if you like. Um, those are called OIDs, or object identifiers. Um, and uh, in um, CDA, basically, we use OIDs to identify code systems. Uh, think about a raw code, like a link code from the pre previous slide, and imagine if you didn't know that it was a link code. You just had that code, uh, you know, 18748-4. Um, without knowing what code system it comes from, you have no way to look up what its meaning is. Um, so we always pair codes in CDA with those OIDs, or object identifiers, uh, so that you can find what code system it comes from. And, uh, you know, those OIDs are uh, present and stored in the HL7 OID registry, uh, which you can find in the URL uh, up here on screen, hl7.org slash OID. So if you ever see an OID in a CDA document, you can always look up what it stands for um, and then uh, uh, use that to further process the codes that are present. Uh, we will go more into the HL7 OID registry and OIDs in general later, um, but uh, for, for now that was just uh, sort of sufficient to understand how to um, process uh, those codes and code systems. Okay, uh, next slide. Right. Um, so one other important thing to note when you're um, dealing with attachments is there's a difference uh, between uh, codes that a uh, payer might request versus the codes that you as a provider might respond with. So payers basically request um, attachments using uh, an application called Relma, and there is a tab in that application uh, called the HIPAA tab. Um, so, so Relma is basically it's a tool for for looking up and for mapping loan codes, but most uh, payers will, uh, and providers will be using it for looking up loan codes. And uh, the idea is that uh, you know that uh, HIPAA tab gives a set of generic document types like console note and such, and that a, a payer will typically request one of those high-level document types when they're looking for more information. As a provider, you may respond with the exact code that was requested, but you may also look through your uh, content and find out that, hey, you've got something more specific, such as an anesthesiology consult note, which has its own line code. So it is perfectly possible to respond uh, with that instead, uh, since the anesthesiology consult note is actually a subtype of consult note. Um, but there may be a case where you actually don't have the code uh, that the payer requested. In that case, it is still legal to respond with any kind of document that you have that you feel would address that request for more information. Uh, so w w when you're taking that approach, what you need to do is just be aware that LOINC is very broad at the code system that encompasses more than just document type codes. So you do, uh, since you're responding with a clinical document, you need to restrict your search to codes that are part of the LOINC document ontology. Um, so if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll explain this in a little, uh, a little more detail. 
So uh, up here on screen is a, um, a, a view of uh, uh, Realma, and this, this shows two screens, basically um, uh, one that shows uh, uh, structured uh, documents that have an implementation guide um, uh, present on the, on the left, and then on the right, there's another list of uh, attachments that are or perhaps unstructured and maybe don't have a CD implementation guide uh, currently associated with them, um, other than the, what's called the generic unstructured document template that is in consolidated CDA. Um, but the idea is these are the kind of codes that a payer uh, uh, might uh, look through um, and, and put in their request for more information. Um, and then as a provider, you would, uh, uh, again, take this code and then determine if you have the actual request or if you want to provide something more specific or something alternative. Next slide, please. So if as a uh, provider, you can't find the code that you're looking for on the HIPAA tab, again, you can basically add any search term. In this case, I just searched uh, uh, Realm for any, any document type of type note uh, or that has a keyword note associated with it. So I'll find things like administrative note, Mission of vowel notes and such, um, but I did add that um, uh, search term uh, uh, limiter that says scale colon doc after my search term. Uh, this is important in Roma again to limit your search to blank document type codes versus things like um, um, lab panels and such, uh, which again do not represent documents or would not be legal attachment types. Um, and again, in your search field, you can put whatever you want. If you want to look for a discharge summary, you can type discharge summary there and come up with a line code for discharge summary. Um, so it's a very powerful tool. Uh, it is fairly easy to use, again, if you follow those rules and do limit your searches to uh, document type codes. All right, uh, next slide. All right, so uh, moving on away from document type codes, uh, let's talk about some more metadata. Uh, then this next one is the document title, and this is the human readable title for the document. Uh, the general rule is it should not conflict with the line code, um, but it may be worded slightly differently than the official display name of a line code. And again, this is to uh, account for things like local practice, uh, differences in, in naming and preferred titles among uh, finishing physicians and physician groups. Um, so it's, again, perfectly legal for the title to not exactly match the line code, but it should not clinically conflict with it in any way. Uh, next slide. Oh, and, and that title is what you actually see when you bring it up on a web browser. So next up is the uh, document date, also known as the effective time in CDA. Uh, this represents the time that the document was created. And it is important to note that um, for scanned documents, so her historical documents, it's the time that the original paper document was created, not the time that it was scanned and turned into bits and bytes. Um, so uh, often that might, uh, um, th th those two instances might differ by sometimes years. Uh, so it is important that if you're scanning a document from 2015, that the effective time lists 2015 as the date, uh, not uh, today's date when you scan it. Next slide. Now, you might note that the um, uh, date time format there on the previous slide is looked a little bit odd. Um, First of all, when you render these CDA documents, they don't show up in that format. Uh, they are rendered in a human readable format. Um, but it, it is important to note if you're an implementer of CDA documents that the date time uh, data types that CDA uses are not the same as you might expect if you're, for instance, a Java developer or JavaScript developer uh, and such. Uh, typically, you, you might expect date time formats to have hyphens between the year, month, day. Um, uh, that is not true of HL7's uh, um, uh, version three data types. Rather, they are all squished together um, as shown here. So it's year, month, day, hour, minute, seconds, uh, optionally milliseconds if you wish, and then a, a UTC offset. Um, it is possible to omit digits to express less precision. Uh, the most common formats that you'll see in CDA documents exchanged in the wild are the year, month, day format. So um, uh, or, uh, to express just a simple date or the um, date timestamp, which is that year, month, day, hours, minutes, seconds, and UTC offset. So examples before where we've got 2017-09-10 all squished together represents September 10, 2017. 2709-10-10-30. Uh, hyphen zero zero five zero. That represents uh, again September 10, 2017. You notice those first six uh, um, 
uh, or sorry, eight digits are all the same. And then it, and then it actually represents the time, 10.30 a.m. and zero seconds uh, uh, Eastern time. So Eastern Standard Time is uh, five hours from UTC. Next slide. All right. Um, the key patient demographics that are required by the CDA header and required for meaningful use compliant are, uh, compliance are listed below. You'll need the patient ID or IDs, and these are things like their social security number, their driver's license number, their medical record number. So all those need to be uh, present. Their address and contact information, their name, gender, and uh, also for meaningful use, you're required to share uh, race and ethnicity information as well. Next slide. So this is how uh, CDA represents this in XML. Uh, it represents the patient demographics using a field called the record target. Um, the idea is, you know, uh, it's supposed to be the um, patient chart or record that is the, the target of this document where you would put this document, think of it that way. Um, and uh, this information at the very top, we have an ID uh, present, and this is just a, a example ID in this case, but this could uh, just as well be a patient's social security number or their passport number. Um, and these can repeat, so you can have multiple IDs associated with the patient. Then we have their address line, their street address, and this is broken up into discrete fields, so you can parse out what city, state, and, and postal code uh, 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 separately without having to do text processing. We also show their uh, telephone information. I'll, I'll describe that uh, URI format a little bit later. Uh, their name is broken up in a given family. You can also have suffixes and prefixes and such present. Next are their uh, uh, other demographics like their gender, birth date, race, and ethnicity codes. Um, um, now let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. I want to talk a little bit about um, some of those codes that are present in the patient demographics. Again, CCDA and meaningful use require the use of certain value sets uh, for, 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 for transmitting gender codes and such. And by value set, I basically mean a list of codes um, uh, that are legal for a given purpose. Um, uh, in consolidated CDA and again in meaningful use as well, we agreed on a, a certain set of codes from certain code systems that need to be used so that everyone who's sending or receiving these documents has a common understanding and can parse and process the data um, uh, using the same uh, 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 you know, understanding. In order to look up the value sets that are used for consolidated CDA and meaningful use, we use a tool called the Value Set Authority Center or VSAC. Um, so you can find VSAC at that URL below, vsac.nlm.nah.gov. Um, and in that tool, you can search for and download all consolidated CDA value sets. One thing to note is it does require a free UMLS license to access uh, VSAC. Um, basically, the first time you use it, you'll need to uh, register for, for that license. Um, it might take a few days to receive it. Um, and really, that is just to verify that um, uh, you're using this for a U.S. use case. The so VSAC is a U.S. tool. Uh, we do uh, the U.S. government licenses code systems like Snowman and such that are uh, not necessarily free for all countries. So we do just basically verify that you're using VSAC for a U.S. use case. Uh, once you verify that, um, then you've got access to search for and download all the value sets. So uh, next slide. I'll give a quick, quick um, demonstration of VSAC. So here is, uh, after you log into VSAC, uh, you might uh, click on the Search Value Sets tab up the upper left there. And this would bring you to a, um, a search field where you can type in a particular value set that you're looking for. So for instance, in that, under the name field, you could actually type gender and uh, hit return, and that would limit the search to all value sets that have gender in it, such as the administrative gender value set that I have highlighted. Um, uh, once you find a value set that you're looking for, you would click on the OID, which is a hyperlink, and then you get the value set details, which are shown on the next slide. If you could please advance the slides one more time. Here, now we've actually got the um, uh, codes that are present in the value set, such as female, male, or undifferentiated, as well as the OIDs for the code system. Um, so those are the two key fields that you need to populate in your CDA instances. So as we see below, we have the administrative gender code that I had referenced on a couple slides back. And we've populated it with the code for M. You can look up that this is the code for male. And you can see also that that 
uh, code system, uh, uh, that OID ending in 5.1 is the same one as is listed as a code system OID for that uh, uh, value set. So you can easily find all the pieces of information that you need to populate your CDA documents. Next slide. Okay, much like the patient demographics, uh, CDA also allows you to represent detailed information about who uh, the folks that uh, are participating in this document, such as the author or signer of the document as well. Um, so uh, authors in a document typically include the following information, such as the time the document was authored, any IDs about the author, so this could be the clinician's um, uh, national provider identifier and such, uh, perhaps their local employee ID, uh, their name, address, contact information, and what healthcare organization they're representing. Next slide. So as we move through these examples, we find that they start to look very similar, actually. Um, the author example, aside from being called author, actually has a lot of the same kind of information, such as address, ID, telecom, uh, the uh, uh, person's name and such. Uh, so, so a lot of the um, uh, the, the information is is uh, 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 very similar. And once you start authoring one of these, you, you, it's quite easy to to do more. Um, next slide. So I do like to bring up a little example of IDs and OIDs. I already mentioned OIDs as being a way to identify the code system that is present with a code, but in, they operate, also work in a similar fashion with IDs. Um, so without a uh, some kind of namespace or flag on an ID, you might not know exactly what kind it is. So given the example that's on the screen, Smith3210G, uh, what kind of ID is that? Is that a Mayo Clinic medical record number? Is that a Colorado driver's license number? Or perhaps some kind of international ID? Um, there's not actually enough information on the screen to tell that at this point. But if we go to the next slide, um, now uh, we've got that uh, OID associated with that ID. And if you look up that OID ending in 3.53, uh, for instance, in the H07 OID registry, you can see that the description of this object is a Washington Motor Vehicle Bureau OID, and its desired symbolic name is Washington DLN, or Washington Driver's License Number. So now you know that this is a Washington State Driver's License Number, um, and it's, it's quite clear, and, and, and now maybe you know what field in your database to populate uh, uh, with this information. So that's why those OIDs are useful, and the HLS and OID registry is, again, a powerful tool to look up OIDs uh, if you're receiving documents or to look up what OID you should use if you're creating documents, maybe your provider organization. Um, it is also possible using the HL7 OID registry to get an OID for your own organization. Uh, for instance, if you've got uh, local IDs like medical record numbers and such that you wish to, um, to, to use in your CDA documents, uh, again, you need to create an OID uh, for them so that they can be differentiated from, for instance, the Mayo Clinic's uh, medical record number or any, or any other organizations. Um, so again, you can go uh, to HL7 OID registry and get an OID. They do charge a fee for getting OIDs there though, but looking up OIDs is free. Uh, next slide. So for folks who, uh, again, want more information on OIDs or, or wish to look up some, uh, you can go to the HL7 OID registry here at hl7.org slash OID. Um, one other interesting thing you can do here uh, that I find extremely useful is, is you can click on, um, it's a little bit hard to see on screen, but there's a link that says OID Excel reports. Underneath it is one that says all OIDs. If you were to click on that, you could actually bring up, uh, it would actually download a spreadsheet with all the OIDs that HL7, uh, uh, the HL7 OID registry is aware of. Um, uh, so that way you don't necessarily need to keep going back to the HL7 OID registry for dynamic lookups. You can download the whole list and load your own database with that information and do your own lookups quite efficiently. All right, uh, next slide. So uh, next field that we're going to talk about is the provider organization or custodian. So this represents the organization that's responsible for the document, typically the provider organization that created it. Um, and typically for a provider organization, you're going to include that organization's ID, such as their OID, um, uh, their name, address, and contact information. Next slide. So this is how a, uh, a, a custodian or a provider organization is represented in CDA. Um, uh, again, it's that little snippet of XML there that basically gets down to their name, uh, telephone, and address information. Um, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. 
where we talk about the signing clinician. So this represents the clinician with legal authority to sign the document. Often it is the same person as the author, but it can be a different person. For instance, a clinical document might be authored by a resident uh, who doesn't have the legal authority to necessarily sign a document yet, or the, the, the level of required experience uh, required by the hospital. So in that case, the uh, clinician who's supervising their residency might be the one to actually sign the document, even though the uh, resident authored it. Next slide. So the information that's present in the legal authenticator, as it's called, it uh, looks, again, very similar to what you found in the author uh, uh, XML fragment. So if you can populate that, you can populate this as long as you remember to change legal authenticator or author to legal authenticator at the top. Uh, but it's the same kind of information, again, typically even the, the exact same person. Next slide. I did promise uh, uh, earlier that I would uh, discuss, um, I'll give some more information on these formats for phone numbers and email addresses. Uh, basically, the way that HL7's uh, CDA data types work is that when you send things like uh, telephone numbers and email addresses, uh, you need to use a specific format. This, in particular, this is called a URI format. Um, this is the same format that you would use when you're, coding, when you're representing telephone numbers or email addresses in a web page. And the idea is that this facilitates computer-based processing. Just like if you code up a telephone number in a web page using this format, you could click on that link and it might bring up Skype or some other uh, uh, dialer uh, to make a phone call for you. Or you click on uh, email address hyperlink and it would bring up Microsoft Outlook or another mail client. Uh, using that same format allows uh, CDA documents to be processed in the same, uh, in a similar fashion. So again, whenever you throw in a telephone number or email address, uh, you need to turn it into this URI format. In other words, prefix it with TEL colon for a telephone number or mail to colon for an email address. Uh, and then it will be legal uh, according to the HL7 data types. Next slide. Now, sometimes you might uh, find that you don't have a piece of information that is uh, perhaps required by the CDA spec or required by meaningful use. Uh, fortunately, CDA allows an escape hatch uh, for this case. Uh, it's called a null flavor. Um, I won't go into details of why it's called that, but basically it, it, it lets you state a reason why you don't have a piece of required information. Uh, there are quite a few uh, um, codes in the null flavor code system uh, that the CDA spec itself details in, um, in gory detail, um, but there are a few that are that are most common. In particular, the, the one that says NI, which is simply for no information. Uh, if you just don't have a piece of information in your database, that's the best thing to do. Just put NI, no information. You you might wish to be more specific and use a null flavor such as UNK for unknown. If if you really uh, you know capture the fact that something's unknown in your system versus just that it's blank, uh, you can do that. But generally, I recommend using NI. Uh, that's the most generic null flavor, and and the one uh, most commonly used. Um, but there are more specific ones if you want to, for instance, indicate that you're masking something for privacy. Maybe this is a highly confidential document and you actually don't want the patient's demographics shared. Well, you can use a null flavor of MSK to note that it's masked uh, for some reason. So th there are many options like that that are present. All right, uh, next slide. Uh, so there is a lot of what I call basic header boilerplate information in CDA documents. Um, but these are um, snippets of XML that you can basically just use directly. Uh, these cover fields that are either fixed by the CDA or CCDA spec or that are um, typically defaulted to the point where, where you very rarely see variations in them. And uh, you know, four of them that I got up here are the realm code, which basically says, states that this is a, a US-based document. Um, uh, you know, all consolidated CDA documents are, and all documents that we're going to use for attachments are because they require the use of the CCDA US realm header template, as I mentioned. Likewise, the type ID, uh, this is just basically HL7's way of saying that this is a uh, CDA document. Um, it's just their their identification mechanism for the kind of of uh, standard that it is. So this is always defaulted. Uh, next is the confidentiality code. This is sometimes varied. Say if you've got a VIP 
uh, such as you know, uh, you know, maybe a a celebrity or a, a high-ranking government official uh, that's visiting your uh, uh, provider organization. But typically, it's just defaulted to N for normal confidentiality. And by by normal, you know, by the N does not mean no, not confidential. It means normal confidentiality. All the rules of HIPAA apply. Uh, but occasionally, like I said, if you've got a very you know VIP, you might change that to V, which is the code for for you know very restricted. Um, Likewise, the language code, most documents that will be exchanged in the U.S. are in English, so you can just default that language code to EN-US, um, but it is legal to change that, say, if you've got documents that are in Spanish that you're exchanging, um, uh, th there are a set of uh, codes, and again, you can look up the value sets for the language codes um, uh, uh, and, and put in a code for another language if, if need be. Next slide. Now, there are some other common metadata fields um, that are present based on your use case or document type codes. Uh, there are, you know, CDA provides a way to capture versioning info. For instance, say that, um, you know, I previously sent version one of a document. Now I'm sending version two and I want to replace it. Um, uh, that's not required by the attachments implementation guides, um, uh, but it is useful and it is the approach is documented in there. Uh, you can also share and counter dates that are present. It's not, again, a required field, but it is a fairly common use case. And for things like, um, uh, you know, many of the note types that are present in consolidated CDA, uh, specific ones might require an encounter date. You can also list uh, information on orders and procedures. Uh, so, for instance, if you're getting back a report, uh, you know, that's a diagnostic imaging report based on a um, an order for an MRI, uh, um, that, that source order and its ID can be listed in the CDA document. And you can also capture consents, uh, the, the, any consents that a patient may have given. Um, again, we, we're not going to detail these in this particular slide, but I would refer you to the HL7 Attachments Implementation Guide and Consolidated CDA for more details if you wish. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and move on to our wrap-up. And uh, um, uh, basically, uh, um, uh, actually, go ahead and move on to the next slide. So there are some key references on this slide uh, that I would direct you for more information. Um, first off is the uh, CDA spec itself. Again, this is the international base specification from 2005. Um, uh, this lays the groundwork for CDA and is a good read if you want to understand a uh, good understanding of CDA in general. Um, but uh, more important, I would say, is a uh, consolidated CDA. This is sort of your one-stop shopping guide for how we share uh, clinical documents in the US uh, for primary care and for transfer of care. Um, uh, in addition to that, the HL7 Attachments Implementation Guide says how we use things like the CCDA header or, U, or, or, or US ROM header from CCDA um, uh, to define attachments in the US. And it also gives some good background information, a little bit more detail than I provided here about how uh, uh, X12 and CDA work together and how the various uh, scenarios uh, such as solicited, unsolicited, prior auth and such are orchestrated. Next is the uh, reference to the um, uh, RELMA tool, the Reconstruct Link Mapping Assistant. You can go to link.org and there's a link right on the home page to download RELMA if you wish to use that to look up your link codes. The HL7 OID registry, again, is a great reference for um, uh, looking up OIDs, either if you have an OID, uh, you received an OID, then you need to find out what its definition is, or if you need to look up, say, the OID for a Washington State driver's license number or a uh, uh, U.S. Social Security number, uh, you can look those up using the OID registry. Um, I'm going to skip over the example status for a second and talk briefly about the Value Set Authority Center. Uh, again, we mentioned this, these in the slides uh, previously. Um, uh, this is your go-to place for looking at value sets, all your gender, race codes, and such. And when we get into structured documents in a future webinar, this is also where you go to look up, uh, for instance, um, what code you use for a patient's problem list or, or for lab results immunizations and such. So all that information is present in the Value Set Authority Center. Okay, now, now I'll skip back to the CDA examples task force. Um, I, I like to mention this one, um, and if there's time or, or a question about it, maybe I'll show a demo later. But this is a great resource uh, to go to if you want examples on how to um, uh, code a particular 
uh, you know, things using CDA markup that maybe I didn't cover in this webinar. There's literally hundreds of examples there, and you can uh, and a great search tool at the front of it as well, so you can search for and find uh, good examples that you can just pull into your systems and reuse directly uh, to, to learn how to craft certain aspects of CDA. So it's a great resource, and I encourage everyone who's implementing uh, um, uh, CDA for attachments, either as a document creator or as a recipient, uh, to lo look there for examples on how things should work. And then lastly, uh, as I mentioned at the top of this webinar, the um, uh, uh, this one was highly technical, um, but if you wanted more of an overview of attachment standards and maybe a discussion of some use cases uh, where attachments have been used, um, uh, the previous two webinars that are linked here uh, give you that information. They are present on the CAQH website. All right, um, so Jessica, I think we'll hand it back to you and we can start uh, uh, digging into those polling questions. Thank you so much, Rick. I really appreciate you sharing your wealth of knowledge with us and this was highly informative, so thank you very much. Uh, so we're gonna take, um, do two polling questions very briefly and then I'd like to uh, start out with our Q&A. So for the first polling question, and this is a check all that apply question. So if you represent a provider organization um, and are planning to implement electronic attachments, which, if any, of the following are true? So let's go ahead and launch the poll and I'll go through the answers. Currently using a 12, have a meaningfully use certified EHR, have administrative and clinical documents that exist only on paper, have administrative and clinical documents outside the EHR in electronic format, and the final option is have a document management system or are using LOINC. Um, so again, this is a check all that apply, and let's give this a couple of seconds to kind of see where our audience is. Okay, five more seconds, and then we will share the results. Okay, so let's go ahead and share the results. Um, and I think um, the, the clear uh, popular option uh, for this question was currently using X12, um, and the others are, are pretty much even. Um, so Rick, um, what do you think of this uh, question? Do you have any insights? Oh uh, well, well for, for starters, I'm I'm glad to hear most folks were using are currently using X12 because that uh, uh, again tells me that there's a um, you know a, a, you know a good path to getting to sharing attachments using that, and also it means that I didn't need to focus quite as much of my time on X12 as, as CDA. So hopefully I address the right topic here. Um, I, I it is interesting to me that the balance between clinical documents that exist only in paper and those that exist outside the EHR and electronic format are pretty close. So this is actually kind of surprising. I thought I was expecting to see more that existed only on paper and, and less outside the EHR and electronic, but, but that, that's uh, uh, good to know for me. And um, it looks like the use of certified EHRs is actually um, quite low with this crowd. I would have expected higher than 28%. So that's a bit of a uh, surprise for me. Oh, oh, oh but, but actually we should, probably should have clarified whether you are a provider <laughs> before you answer that question, because um, uh, that might just represent how many folks are actually provider organizations. That's correct. Um, thanks, Rick. So let's um, get on with our next polling question. And again, this is another um, check all that apply question. Uh, so the question is, if you're waiting to implement electronic claims with cash, and what is, um, what is the reason? And again, uh, this is a, this is a check all that apply. Um, so the, the options are you're waiting on regulatory direction. Second option, waiting on industry direction. Third option is waiting due to budgetary constraints. We all feel that. And the last option is waiting to see how value-based care impacts claims. Um, so let's uh, launch this poll. And again, check whatever answer or answers make the most sense uh, to you. And we will go ahead and give it five seconds and then we'll share those results. Okay, let's go ahead and share the, those results. And um, Rick or Bob, I'm gonna ask you um, to uh, let us know what, what you uh, see in these responses. So again, the clear, the top two choices were definitely um, 
the most uh, popular, so weighting on regulatory direction as well as weighting on industry direction. And budgetary constraints is, uh, is definitely a pain point for folks. So what do you think of these responses? Uh, well, well I'll, I'll go first, Bob, if you don't mind. Is, uh, it's actually kind of what I expected because it's very similar to what I hear um, uh, speaking in the industry and, 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 and talking to folks is, is they want clear direction. Um, a lot of folks are, you know, maybe don't want to commit budget until they know that they're committing in the right direction, something that's going to be supported and compatible with pending regulation. Um, so this, uh, um, and, and, and in the absence of regulation, they want clear industry direction, again, for those same concerns. So this, this is a, a kind of what I was, exactly what I was expecting to see. Yeah, Mr. Bob, but I would agree that um, even with our study from two years ago, we saw that the industry was really on a, a wait and see um, where the direction should be. And everyone's really looking for regulation instead of adopting something that has um, industry momentum. So, uh, you know, with we had over 300 participants in our last cycle of um, our environmental scan, and this was definitely a, a clear indicator of then as well. Uh, thank you, Bob and Rick. Um, and so I think now we have some time for Q&A. Um, and so, Rick, I think uh, most of the questions we've gotten have, are for you. So um, get ready. Um, so the sure. first question here is, um, so what are some of the barriers that you see um, keeping the CCDA for being used more widely? Well, um, uh, one of the key ones actually was uh, um, an unfortunate consequence of, of, of the way meaningful use was adopted is uh, the CCDA spec actually called out a, a large variety of, of document types, but meaningful use excluded what, at least for attachments, was the, the most common one, which is the unstructured document. You know, uh, you know a lot of folks have uh, things in administrative systems, systems outside of EHRs that are, that are not fully structured documents. Um, so the first round of meaningful use actually said if you're, you know, getting, you know, going for EHR incentives and such, you need to share structured documents only. And that, in my view, kind of stifled uh, the um, uh, the dissemination of large volumes of of, of CDA documents. Uh, would instead gave a sort of later, later focus on setting the bar really high for coded data. Uh, and that's one thing that I actually see the attachments implementation guides and likely regulation to turn around and really open up the floodgates to all kind of clinical information um, so that we actually see, uh, you know, again, huge volumes of data being shared. Um, maybe the level of structured data is is less, but that will improve over time. The main thing is to get the get the floodgates open, get the information flowing, and get stuff in the hands of clinicians and, and, and payers as well to both facilitate patient care and to support claims adjudication. Um, and for many, you know, human readable documents is a, 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 a good enough stepping stone, certainly better than, than nothing, which is kind of what we have for a, many types of documents today. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that this is actually going to uh, have a huge impact on, you know, again, uh, on the industry. I, I, I hope so, Rick. Um, so here's the next question. So how does the uh, X12 270 275 attachment transaction tie into the CCDA information? Oh, well, as I kind of said on a previous slide, it, uh, um, the 275 is, is much like the envelope. Um, so that gives all the information that you need from a, uh, you know, um, if you're a, you know, a payer, for instance, to actually marry up that attachment with the claim, with the patient, and, and any request for information. Um, but the uh, the CDA document is the payload uh, within it, and it contains all the cl clinical information that you would need to actually adjudicate that claim. Um, so that's really the, the the way I describe the two: is you know, one is the envelope, and one is the payload or, or the letter inside the envelope. Um, so hopefully that uh, explains it enough. Yeah, it, it, it certainly does. And for um, the person who asked that question, um, we can refer back to that slide and, and um, you can look at the recording when it's available if you need a refresher on that. Um, so another question for you, Rick. Um, can you describe the most common type of constraints that apply to the header for all universal realm documents within the scope of the HL7 implementation guide? That's pretty specific. Sure. Um, so s some of the most common ones are, are things like um, that every participant, you know, every person that's that's playing a role in this document or is listed in the metadata, um, have a, a, a U.S. address. Um, so the addresses in uh, in the base CDA spec uh, 
can cover any kind of address in the world. And I've, I've lived in quite a few countries over time, and uh, you might think that everybody uses, you know, street address lines and, and street numbers and such, and, and, and well, they don't. Um, so, so that's like one common thing that you'll see is, is a requirement that all the addresses for U.S.-based documents conform to uh, U.S. address restrictions. They have a street address line, city, state, zip code, and such. Um, uh, likewise, we have a lot of restrictions on the IDs, particularly on providers, and others that you uh, want to prefer the provider send an NPI, for instance. Um, and, and also that, that everyone uh, has, uh, you know, things like, uh, you know, their name, contact information, and, and address present. So it's really just sort of requirements to make sure we get that minimum amount of information present so that we can actually contact all the people like the patient or, or, or you know, marry up a document with the patient's record or potentially go back and, and contact the providers that were present uh, and, and contributed to the information in, in the document. Uh, uh, lastly, some things that are, that are common uh, is, um, you know, uh, things like the template IDs that I mentioned that will say what kind of document uh, this is, whether it's a history and physical or a discharge summary, because the expected clinical content in the body, which I'll get to in a future webinar, uh, is different for all those document types. But you actually declare that um, conformance to a particular type of document in the header as well. So those are some of the most common things that you'll find. Thanks, Rick. Um, so we've gotten a couple of iterations of the same question, which is, is there any kind of an update on the time frame where an attachment regulation is expected to be released? I know we've been checking the unified agenda every day. Um, uh, yeah, everybody's rubbing their crystal ball on that one. I wish I had an answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we will keep checking that unified agenda, and hopefully there will be some information um, soon. Um, so let's see, here's a, a question that came in on uh, about FHIR. Um, how does FHIR help with the storytelling approach to CCDA? Uh, well, I, I, I guess I'm a, uh, the, the storytelling approach, <laughs> I guess uh, I could read that a couple ways. Um, I'll, 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 I'll do it both ways. One is um, every clinical document tells a story. It has a human readable narrative um, that is present and uh, FHIR supports that same approach. Um, in fact, it does it in a much similar fashion. Uh, every FHIR resource, including FHIR documents, can include uh, uh, HTML as, as their narrative. Uh, so so um, CDA has its own sort of special markup that can be converted to HTML for display, but FHIR just uses HTML directly. Um, so you can include human readable information as well as your coded data, just as you can at CDA. Um, now, uh, in terms of the other story, which is, you know, how do we turn this into it was a success story, for instance, and how does, uh, you know, the, um, the sort of uh, promotion of, of CDA and clinical documents, uh, 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 you know, tie in with FHIR. Um, you know, the consolidated CDA spec has been out for, for quite a few years now. It's been cited in meaningful use, as, as we've said. Um, but, but CDA itself is an older standard it's from 2005. It doesn't necessarily use the same kind of modern web standard or even data types that we would use today. So it's a little more difficult for folks to pick up, um, um, especially folks that are, you know, maybe uh, uh, junior developers or uh, coming out of um, uh, college with uh, computer science degrees or informatics degrees and such. Um, FHIR takes a very modern and simple approach to uh, both content and the, the, the web APIs that are used uh, to move data around. Um, so in, in effect, it um, uh, it, it simplifies things a lot. It lets the technology get out of the way of the harder problems uh, um, uh, that we have to solve in healthcare. And, and just, uh, um, you know, uh, in, in, in my opinion, it's a, it's a great evolutionary approach. And uh, I'm also, aside from being one of the uh, editors of the uh, CCDA spec, I'm also the, the lead editor on the CCDA on FHIR specification. So I'm actively working on creating a FHIR representation, representation of consolidated CDA. And uh, with my goals of getting out the door in, in the next couple of weeks, certainly before uh, Thanksgiving, I, I've got to promise myself I won't get turkey unless I get CC on fire <laughs> off the door. So, um, so uh, look forward to that. Um, and uh, um, again, pay attention to some of the HL7 uh, listservs or in marketing and such uh, if you want more information on that. Uh, that's great. Um, thank you, Rick. And uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Even with 90 minutes, it just kind of flew by. Um, Rick, thank you so much for uh, taking uh, time out of your busy schedule to share this information with us. Um, and I'd like to also thank our audience for taking 
some time out of your day. Um, so on this slide, on slide 73, we've got our next few webinars um, that are coming up. We've got a webinar on November 20th. It's the beginning of a series that we're going to do on uh, BBP. And then on December 12th, uh, we're going to do our last town hall of the year. So hope you'll join us for those uh, webinars and look forward to having more webinars uh, with our colleagues at Len in Lantana next year to keep uh, having this conversation. Um, so in the next slide, um, I know we've covered a lot of material today, so here are some key takeaway messages. Um, and just as a reminder, the slides and the recording will be available uh, sometime tomorrow on the website, and we'll also email them to you so that you have that reference material at your fingertips. And um, just on the next slide, thank you very much. And these are ways to, to reach us if you have any further questions. Have a good afternoon.